Yeah. Love you, buddy. Yeah. Love you, buddy. Yeah. Love you, buddy. Yeah. yeah. I want to take that with you. Good morning. I'm going to uh, kind of just jump into things. I, I did want to say a um, public welcome to Bonnie back there. Bonnie, it, it is great to see you again. Uh, been several years. Great to see you. Good to be with you. Love you dearly. <laughs> so uh, thank God for you. And everybody else in the room as well. <laughs> Brother, I really appreciated your prayer for our nation. That was spot on. I believe that wholeheartedly. Uh, appreciate that. So, uh, so I'm going to jump into uh, several scriptures here that I, I want to give us the scriptures as my intent. Give us the scriptures. I don't know how much time I'll be able to spend on each one. Otherwise, we'd be here forever, and I don't want to be here forever. You don't want to be here forever. We're all in agreement, at least on that. So. So in starting, I'm going to point back to my, uh, my friend. He's actually getting up moving back here. I forget your first name, brother. Quentin. Quentin, okay. So I saw the angel assigned to you since the time you were, before you were born, actually, standing behind you this morning, whispering in your right ear, and the Lord was anointing your right ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church in this time. But what he was whispering was concerning the call of the Lord that's upon you and reminding you of this call, God's choosing of you, God's purpose in you. Uh, this is not a general statement. You would know this. Um, of his call, of his choosing of you, and how over the next uh, months and years, uh, the Lord is going to bring fruit to fruition his purpose in calling and purpose and and then commissioning of you into his work and into his service. I hope this is encouraging to you. I don't think this is new information, but we've never talked about any of this, have we? But the Lord knows. And it was from your birth, actually while you were in the womb, that the Lord chose and protected you and has kept you. And I saw a really great sense of humor, better than mine, is that true of you? Much better than mine. It wouldn't take a lot to be better than mine, but I mean a real good sense of humor, which I think, Bonnie, don't you? I think it takes a good sense of humor, <laughs> to be honest. We better have a sense of humor. Otherwise, we're going to cry all the time, don't you think? But anyway, I want to say to you, if the realness of the Lord's purpose and call is upon you, you're in the right place in mentoring and training. And I just want to say yes and amen to the Lord's purpose with you. I hope that's encouraging to you, brother, to your wife your new wife. So anyway, um, so um, we're going to look at, like I said, several scriptures. We're going to start in the Old Testament in the book of Chronicles, First Chronicles, and then move forward. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned last night uh, Chronicles chapter 26. I'm not going to read all of it, but in chapter 26, a foundational or principle truth is laid out in how the Lord builds his house. And it's summed up here in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 26 uh, when it's talking about the commanders, the king, David did, even Saul knew to do this. They dedicated part of the spoil won in battle or battles. That's verse 27, chapter 26 of 1 Chronicles. They dedicated part of the spoil won in the battles to the repair or the building, both are implied, of the house of the Lord. So that's part of my reference last night. I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about this in specifics, or at least a few aspects of that, those battles this morning. Then this is going to seem weird, but uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, Then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel, to number the warriors, actually, as you know. So keep that scripture in view. And then starting with uh, Psalm 119, we're going to read through the rest of the, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. No, we're not. <laughs> 
Let's watch them post that up there. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I just can't help myself, Neil. I get carried away and my humor gets the best of me, Bonnie, and there I go. So, No, no, we're not going to do that, but we're going to look at several of more scriptures which we need to look at beginning in Luke. So turn with me to the book of Luke. Again, I want to be sure and get the scriptures in there um, so that uh, in case I don't get to everything, at least the scriptures are there and what I'm trying to say. So looking in Luke chapter 2, uh, coming through the, starting with verse 21 and then coming down uh, through to verse um, at least 35 would, would stop there. I'm not going to read all of it, but I want us to remember Simeon has been promised by God that he will not die until he sees the Lord's Christ. Is that not incredible? People say, well, there's no way you could know. He knew. He knew that. He'd been directly promised that. People say, well, you just can't know that. Who's kidding who here? God can say what he wants to, when he wants to, to who he wants to. And he doesn't need my permission to do it, does he, guys? He just doesn't need it. He'll do what he wants to. Are we okay with that? God talks to his people, right? His sheep know his voice. Simeon had been made a promise. You're not dying till you see the Lord's Christ. Now, I know people that uh, one of my friends, I think it was six, is that right, Josiah? Sam was six when the Lord gave him a dream that, uh, about his grandmother, that his grandmother would come to him before he went to his grandmother. So I know people who the Lord has said direct things to, and it's playing out that way. So I just want to point this out in the scriptures, but that's not really my point. That's coming up to something. So Simeon takes the child in his hand, and Simeon re recognizes what the leadership of Israel, spiritually and governmentally, can't see, don't understand, and don't believe. He, by the Spirit, recognizes that the Messiah is this babe. Is that not revelation of Jesus Christ going on there? Takes him in his arm. But here's my point. Is, my point comes to, let's look, look at verse 34. And Simeon blessed them, talking about the parents, and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel. Same thing's true with the people of God in any time. We can get offended at Jesus, guys. And for a sign to be opposed. But it even more so, I want to look at this. And a sword will pierce even your own soul, he says to Mary. To the end, that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So, <clears throat> there's that passage, just bringing some things together here. Now, I want us also to look again, uh, we're dealing with specific things, back to Matthew chapter 11. If nothing else, we'll get the scriptures in. How's that? Matthew chapter 11, beginning with verse number 1, and it came about that when Jesus was finished giving instructions to the 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in the cities. And verse 2, and when John, John the Baptist, in prison heard, so John's in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word to the disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one? Or shall we look for someone else? Are you the Messiah is what's actually being said here. Are you the Messiah or shall we look for someone else? The context behind this, as you all know, is quite stunning. Seeing how it had been revealed to John 
as to who the Messiah would be. John did not recognize his cousin Jesus as being the Messiah until the baptism. It was then and only then that God made known to John the Baptist when he declares, look, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When he sees the dove descending upon the Son of God, which had been promised as the sign, God had promised him a sign, when you see this happen, the dove descending. I don't know if anybody else saw it other than John and Jesus. But John saw. And it's there that John recognizes my cousin is the Son of God. He's, this, he's the Messiah. How, would, how many would agree with me? That's quite the revelation and quite the experience, right? So to come to chapter 11, are you the Messiah? What's happened? And so then moving forward again, you may not like what's about to be said here. <laughs> I don't know. I can't, guys, if it, well, it doesn't matter in one sense. It does, but it doesn't. Readiness is God's requirement no matter what time we're living in. I don't need to, and I do, but I don't need to have Gabriel come to me. Josiah, you guys could verify this. We were already preaching Christ and being ready before Gabriel came to me in April. Because it had been revealed to us that the return of the Lord wasn't going to happen without readiness. That's not something ever taught me. God the Father himself said it to me. But it's in the scriptures. I'm just too blind to see it. Readiness, it, it would not matter. Let's say it this way. If, in the, if the Lord did not return in my lifetime, readiness is right, and I want that work by his Spirit in me. Would I be disappointed if the Lord didn't return in my lifetime? Well, of course. But will that keep me from being ready? Absolutely not. I want the Lord to make me ready by his Spirit, and I want to be willing to make myself ready by the aid of the Spirit. It works both ways. So willingness is, so I want to be clear with that. Um, this should have been the case all along for the past 2,000 years, should have been the case. But it's been this lack of readiness as to why the Lord has not returned. I can't say that strong enough. The Lord would have already returned. He would have returned in the first century. That's why they preached his return, and they meant it, and they were right. But they understood what I didn't understand, and I'm afraid what much of the body of Christ doesn't understand now. They understand if you guys will make yourselves ready and be made ready by the Holy Spirit and by the apostles and prophets preaching and exemplifying the person of Christ, the Lord will come in our time. And that's how they preached it. The Lord wants to come in our time. It's undeniable when you sit in the scriptures. They were not wrong. They were absolutely right. But he didn't return. That's missing the point of their preaching. They too knew that he's not returning without readiness. Do we know that? Right? I'm trying to be clear. Readiness. It's a work of the Spirit within us. Must be allowed. We must be willing. Readiness. You go back and look at the parables of Jesus. He's hitting this issue. Peter hits this issue. Be ye ready, therefore. Ready. Readiness is the issue. God the Father spoke directly to me about it. My son would have already returned had there been readiness. I wanted my son to return in the first century. I never heard anybody say anything like that. Never. I'm not saying it hasn't been said by other people. I'm saying I never heard it. To God the Father said it to me. Undid me. 
He rebuked me. He said, you're, he said, you're not preaching the right gospel. I said, I'm preaching your son, Jesus Christ. Yes, but you have not added my desire for my son to come in your time. You have not preached readiness. Rebuked me. That's how it went, Neil. That's how it went, Jacob. Man, guys. Oh, this was years and years ago. It was two years ago. It wasn't a century ago, Bonnie. It was two years ago. What do you say to that? Nothing but agreement. He's right. I couldn't see it. He says to me, he says this to me, God the Father does. He says uh, about the apostles and prophets of the New Testament, who knew what I didn't know about readiness, the key. You thought they were wrong, don't you, Terry? That wasn't really a question. It was a statement. It's you who are wrong. And he leaned forward looking me in the eye to say it. It's you who are wrong. <laughs> but I'm thinking, I think stupid thoughts. I know y'all don't, but I do. And it gets me in trouble all the time. So I always think stupid thoughts. Because I'm thinking even after he said, but, but Christ didn't return. <laughs> <laughs> that opened me up to further correction. And it's loving correction. I want it, I need it. See, I'm not in this quandary of he loves me, he loves me not. I know he loves me. So he can say whatever he wants to to me the way he wants to say it. And I love the fact that God likes to come in on my own humor, my own terrible personality. That's saying it mildly. <laughs> and talk to me the way I talk. Now, I believe that uh, the, this earth is in the southern part of the Milky Way galaxy. So, you know, God likes southern slang. <laughs> Had to get that in there somewhere, you know. <laughs> yes, we are a southern planet is my point. <laughs> I'm playing. Anyway, he comes riding in on that and talks to me that way and says things, you know, uh, in my frame of humor. And so, um, talking to me about, you know, how wrong I am, my perception of the apostles and prophets of the New Testament uh, was wrong in that, well, they preached, your, I, this is clear, yes, they preached you would return in their time. They absolutely did that. Multiple times that is shown in the scriptures. Their entire push, though, was readiness. Look at it in the epistles. So they're not just believing some random time of the Lord's coming. This is where God the Father rebuked me. He said, do you think that the, my son's return was established by some random date? He said, I tell you. Pointed at me when he said it. I tell you that that date, he said, I know it. No one else does. He said, but the date's arrived at as to a people making themselves ready. That's how the dates arrived at. Now, they didn't teach us that in the Bible colleges I went to. I could go on and on, but that's not my point. My point's really this, that we're seeing something in these passages I've read that is key that in the preparation and readying which is what I'm after, what God's after, what we're after, right? I want to be made ready. If I'm to speak at all to the people of God, it's going to be along these lines of ready unto the Lord. That's the ministry of John the Baptist. Make a people ready for the Lord. For the Lord. We might be His. For the Lord, right? Say that in your inward man. Ready for the Lord. Not just ready, ready for the Lord. Readiness can mean a lot of things. It doesn't. It means ready for the Lord. Right? So, I want to be locked and loaded on that fact. Colossians chapter 1, he created us for himself. Ready for the Lord. See how that works? It's beautiful, huh? He wants us. Why, I don't know when it comes to me, but he does. <laughs> I joke around with him about it. If I were you, I would not use me. 
I've said that to him at least a hundred times until finally the last time he said, don't ever say that to me again. It's become an excuse with you. <laughs> so I don't say that again. <laughs> Be like saying, don't say ain't again. So I ain't going to say ain't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me bring it together in a few scriptures of final things. This is what we, the scriptures we were looking at is a reference to final preparation, final testing unto preparation. Let me say that again. I'm looking now this morning, my purpose is to look at final testing unto preparation. Last night we looked a bit at the final conflict and battle. But now going deeper as to that battle. Yes, the bride is destined for a direct confrontation with the dragon. The man-child is destined for direct confrontation, direct confrontation with the beast. But now let's go deeper to the inward. What's going on inside as to a final test? And it's there I want to spend the time we have left up on. Is that okay? So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 27. Final words on the cross. Because the final test is always going to involve the cross of Christ, which is not a piece of wood he's hanging on. He is on that, what's called the cross. But I'm talking about the word of the cross that Paul talks about, which is not preaching the crucifixion. Okay? When we talk about the word of the cross, we're not talking about preaching the crucifixion. We're talking about preaching the nature of the Lamb, the cross life, the cross nature, the inward nature of the Godhead. As the Lord said to me one time, I, He didn't have to say it this way, but He did. I'm going to give myself for you, Terry, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Well, I wasn't even back there to stop him, but it still works now. That's a foreign nature to mankind, but it is the nature of the lamb. Quite intense, huh? I love it. Such love. No one deserves, but it's his nature. Thank God, amen? I wouldn't usually in preaching, as this is unique right now for me, at least it has been for the past however umpteen years, I wouldn't usually be quite this open about encounters because I've learned my lesson that uh, an encounter does not transform me. Jesus inside me does. The internal can only be transformed by an internal Jesus as my life, not an encounter with Jesus. Can y'all hear that from me? So I moved away purposefully, intentionally from, they didn't stop happening. I begged him, stop this. Don't let me have any more encounters. He told me, no. It's best that you have what you have and that I use them to test you. Because I realized that Christ in me was where transformation happened. Not all the encounters. I could look back over my own journey in history and could tell that the encounters were wonderful. They were of God, but they were non-transforming. They were exciting. There was revelational information in them. I say it that way, revelational information. But information does not transform. It is the Lord as life replacing my former life is where transformation occurs. And that's inward, not outward. It will affect the outward, but it starts from within. So it's interesting that the Lord's having me to say as much as what I'm saying about encounters right now. What I'm not after is, uh, oh, we need an encounter. No, we need Jesus in us. 
And that's not an encounter. It's the cross life within. He is the cross. It's not the wood he's hanging on. He is that. He's the lamb. He gave himself because he's the lamb to get on that cross. Very clearly, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down freely. He's the cross. Just as he is the gospel. The gospel's not a teaching. The gospel is a person. The cross is not a thing. The cross is the person. He's the cross. He's the end of Adam life. At the beginning of an entirely other than life that we can't have except that Christ in you is the hope of glory. Right? That is the apostolic gospel. We will never have a return to the apostolic truth of the apostles and prophets of the New Testament without understanding the person whom they preached. They did not preach things for things' sake. They preached a person who is the summing up of all things, the bringing together of all that's called truth into a person. And here I am. I'm the truth. That's what Jesus would say to us. I'm the way. I'm the life. Fix your everything on me. Hope, gaze, purpose, plan, thought, and allow myself to remove the veils in you, Terry. And that's what the past years of my journey with it been the removing of prophetic veils that I might behold him as the apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher that he alone is. Been quite the brutal journey, the slap down of God, the smack down of God. Kathy talks about a God smack. I like that imagery. I needed it. I want it. I still do. I'm not done with it. He's not done with me. I feel like I'm at the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of the beginning with a few more million beginnings there. I do. He's the uh, ancient of days. And I'm an almost 63-year-old created being. If I think I know something, boy, am I deceived. And I don't want to. I want to know him, like Paul said in Philippians. So anyway, let's go on. So there's some... Final things that are spoken on the cross. I'm not going to go into all of them. There's two or three of them I want us to see because they're going to play out in our journey and they're going to play out in the woman's journey and they're going to play out in the man-child's journey. That final time period is going to bring these matters front and center. Now, thankfully, God's already been dealing with us about this. But the final time period will be a time, I've said this last night, that hour of testing or the hour of proof as to readiness. Remember I talked about that out of Revelation chapter 3? The hour of testing or the hour of proof. I will keep you. Well, here we are again. It will be proven that the work has been accomplished, has been, this year, one of the words of the cross, finished. A finished work. The first work is in Matthew, first words, or phrase is in Matthew chapter 27, verse number 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As we're looking at the woman, as we're looking at the man child, let's bring this together out of 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Satan's going to attack something very directly, Michael. He has been. But at the end, the dragon, hear me, the dragon is going to attack the woman right here. 
I'm not saying this is the only area, but this may be the most important area. The dragon with that voice, that mouth running. You, Jacob, have been abandoned by God. There it is. You have been forsaken. God is no longer with you. And in the kind of battle she is going to be in, that's very real. When you're up against the dragon, right, Jacob? Let me just say to Bonnie back there, is this not right, Bonnie? Have we not already been being tested? You have been abandoned, Bonnie. You have been forsaken. I know that's real without talking to you about it. I know it from the Lord, but it's not true. Not a bit of it, is it, sister? Not true. No, that's not true. That's not true, Jacob. It never was true. Can you see the test? These final words on the cross are the final test of the Son of God, the final test of John the Baptist. Are you the one? What's being tested here? Trust. That's what's being tested. Trust. As the Lord told me, you cannot entrust yourself to me if you don't trust me. I can't tell you how many times I've failed the Lord in this simple matter of trust. It's real, isn't it, to feel abandoned. There's reasons for it. There's reasons why John the Baptist felt abandoned when you're in prison, and he was. There's reasons. When you've lost almost every friend you ever had, When all that of my perceptions of what it was going to be like are thrown down to the dirt, don't you think, Jacob? Don't you think, Bonnie? When everything's thrown down to the dirt, there's a voice that's really loud in that time. You have been abandoned by God. You were wrong the entire time. that voice of the dragon, that voice of Satan, the adversary of God, the accuser that he is. That's the test of the Son of God, the Son of Man hanging on the cross. He was forsaken for our sake, but he was not forsaken as pertains to himself with his father. It's about to get proven that that's the truth. For our sake, he was brought under the wrath of his father, but not for his own sake. For, sac for sacrificial sake, but not for his own sin. Betrayed by Judas, denied by Peter. Sound familiar? Maybe it doesn't now, but it will. I don't want to prophesy that over you. I'm simply stating what's going to be going on concerning the woman. Can you see that? Can we see it? Can we look at it for a moment? The woman is going to go through this test of the cross. It is as is, it is inevitable for her to be in direct confrontation with the dragon she must be in direct confrontation with the voice of the dragon unleashed against her. You can read about it in chapter 12. We've seen the voice of the dragon so many times in the scriptures, have we not, Brian? The voice of the dragon against Nehemiah, Sanballat, Tobiah, Gershom. The voice of the dragon towards Nehemiah. 
Come down off the wall and let's talk about this thing. Nehemiah answered right. I'm in a great work here. And here's the southern version. I don't have time to come down and talk to you idiots who are plotting to murder me when I come down there. <laughs> That's the southern version, which is actually the correct interpretation. <laughs> I know what you know. Sanballat was a half-breed. That's not, that's not the thing that's really the point. God is emphasizing something about Sanballat. He's half-hearted. He can't be trusted. He's a betrayer. Tobiah, Gershom, don't trust them. They are divided in loyalties, divided in allegiance. They are not for you, Nehemiah. No, my, Nehemiah has the wisdom of God to know better than go talk to those people even. They were plotting to murder him if he came down to where they were. Let me give you an encouragement. Don't go down to where people are who are actually in direct contradiction and confrontation with the will and the work of God. Don't go try to convince them. Let them stew in their own stew. Let God handle it. Don't join with them. Don't unite with them. Don't listen to the voice of the dragon. The temptation even to the Son of God, Son of Man, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There's the battle right on the cross. It's the battle for John the Baptist. Are you the Messiah or do we look for another? having had revealed to him supernaturally by the Lord, by the Spirit of God, this is him. It is a trust issue in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 that comes against David. Never before where well, there's a need to number the fighting men. Why number the fighting men now? You trusted God before to defeat the enemy. Why would you look at, you know what I mean, Jeff? Why would you look now to number your fighting men? Was it the number of your fighting men that defeated your enemies before? Or was it the Lord? So, David, who do you trust in then? Do you trust the number of your fighting men or do you trust the Lord, David? See, Satan rises up in such ways. And when he rises up, you see his confrontation. Don't trust in God anymore. He's not trustworthy is really what he's saying. Again, I thank God that he's been dealing with us already along these lines, has he not? How many with me have found God dealing with us along, already along the lines of trust? God, hear this, God knowing what's in front of us when we don't has been dealing ruthlessly with me, with us concerning trust, knowing the meat grinder we're about to step into. Direct confrontation with the dragon. It's impossible to be made ready without talking about final words. The final words of the dragon, the final temptation, the final attack, the final word of the Lord. I thank God that Christ went through in this instance here. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He went through a reality that we are not, not meant to. Here's what I'm not saying. It goes against everything I was just saying. In other words, yes, he was forsaken for our sake. But that's not for you. 
Ours is a battle different in this. And we need to say this, I believe. I'm going to say this to everybody in the room right now. I think we need to say it out loud. My God, my God, you have not forsaken me. Let's say it on three. One, two, three. My God, my God, you have not forsaken me. One more time. We're going to say it this way, okay, again. My God, my God, you will not forsake me. Okay, can we do that? Y'all agree in agreement? My God, my God, you will not forsake me. He went through that with his father. We will not go through what he went through with his father. We will undergo the attack of the voice of Satan, but we will not be forsaken by God. Can you hear that? Amen. Now that's, uh, if we're going to do a Jericho march, now would be the time. <laughs> Don't, dream, dream, surely the Lord will give you another song on this. <laughs> you know, seriously, I think about those words, don't you, Drew? My God, my God, you have not forsaken me. That is the truth. And he will not. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are not abandoned. We have not been abandoned, Bonnie. Friends abandon you. People abandon you. What, people you thought would never abandon you abandon you. It's painful for me to talk about it because I've been through so much of it. So many others in this room. Extraordinarily painful. I had to keep my heart before the Lord that I don't get a bitter root in me. You know what I mean, Bonnie? You do know what I mean. That's why I'm addressing you. I had to have the Lord come and heal me because I had an open wound. My son helped me, Josiah, to recognize what was going on. But I am not, we are not, and we will not be forsaken like Christ was. The Lord is with you. The Lord is in you. The Lord loves you and has not forsaken you and will not forsake, it, forsake you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Psalm 27, though my father and mother forsake me, David cries, the Lord will not forsake me. Beautiful, huh? The Lord Jesus said to his disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. I will not forsake you. I will come to you. Beautiful, huh? Beautiful. Well, there's another word, and let's go to Luke to look at it here. Words on the cross. <clears throat> this is chapter 23 of the Gospel of Luke. Verse number 46. This is spoken after, my God, my God, why have, thou, why have you forsaken me? This phrase of Jesus Luke 23, 46 is spoken after, after. So you see, the final word is not there in Matthew, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Isn't that beautiful, brother? That's beautiful, isn't it? That's not the final word, guys. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is not the final word. That test is passed. The woman's going to pass the test. The man child's going to pass this test because they're surely going to be tested by the voice of the dragon in his accusation. And the adversary that Satan is is going to test the woman and test the man-child in the heat of the confrontation, which is not a one-time issue, a few moments, but a continued issue. Can you hear me? Perhaps I could say it this way, a three-and-a-half-year issue of constant battle, constant conflict, 
all because the woman is in the will of God. Not because she's out of it. You know, Dylan, he, she's in the will of God. That's why she's undergoing what she's undergoing. It's because you're in the will of God, Bonnie. That's why you go through what you go through. I don't care what the dragon says, do you? I don't care. I don't care. If this is not about Jesus, shoot me and get it over with. Go ahead, Drew. <laughs> don't use blanks either, brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot I could say. I'm, I'm not going to go. Not going to go down that path, Drew. I was thinking of what caliber to hit me with. Let it be some biblical cali caliber. But anyway, I was thinking of a good passage for a nine millimeter. You know. <laughs> anyway, what what ninth chapter of what book best describes? <laughs> That's just my stupid humor. There's another word after, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where the Lord himself is back on personal ground with his Father. Can you hear that? Not corporate ground, personal ground with his Father. There is a distinction. There is the corporate, there is the personal. And on the corporate ground for our sake, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is followed on the personal ground of the son and his father is followed by this. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. There's the victory. It will be ours as well. Victory is your faith. Just quoting that scripture. You used to have songs about it. Faith is the victory. Is quoting a scripture. Victory is your faith. But not our faith. It's the son of God's faith in us, in him. This faith which you have received. Where did we get it from? The spirit of God. That kind of faith man can't Fallen man can't have God's faith. They can have, you don't have the faith of the Son of God until you have the Son of God inside. Then you have the faith of the Son of God. All things pertaining to life and godliness are in Him, including faith. We are wrong about the way we view faith. We, faith, we think faith is believing in something. It is not. The faith, biblical faith is the Son of God being in us in the faith, the eternal faith, part of his very nature that he has in his Father. And when he comes into us, that starts crowding out my little weak way of trusting him, crowding out my little way of having faith in him. And he becomes, as in all things, life, superior life. Superior love, eternal. God's love. No one else has it. No one else ever will. No angel, no seraphim, no cherubim, no living creature, no man, no woman. No one has the love of God but God. Never will until God comes in. Man cannot ever have it of his own. We have Christ and he's the love of God. To be possessed by him becomes necessity, not an option. Same thing in faith. This faith which you have received was because Christ came in. So this preparation, this readying, deals with possession, being possessed of the Lord, right? Right? Him becoming, him increasing, him becoming greater in me instead of me being greater than him. I'm saying that as, not, I don't mean that in some eternal way. I'm saying that Terry Bennett's former life, which is Adamic life, fallen life, crowding out the seed that Christ is, and he comes in as seed, the seed that Christ is, I keep 
him as a seed in me rather than allowing him to come forth in life. My old nature life prevents him from becoming himself fully in me, keeping me in immaturity because maturity is not Terry Bennett becoming something mature. Maturity is the Lord Jesus Christ possessing Terry Bennett. Right? If I can become mature without him, then now why do I need him? So this test is passed by trust. Here it is. Think about it. Your worst at least that's how we would see it in our natural man, our carnal mind, our worst times, plural, times or time. Great darkness when, you know, that once sweet fellowship that we enjoyed seems blocked to us now. I know none of you guys have been through that, but I have. <laughs> I blame of course you have. Some of us have been through very intensive times like that. And it was the Lord leading us through the valley of the shadow of death. So that though we would fear no evil. In that worst time of great darkness, when all around us seems dark, when God seems distant, particularly as to our soul, as to our emotions, as to our soulish understanding, which is what he's dealing with actually. Know, to know the Lord in our soul is not to know the Lord. To know the Lord in our emotions is not to know him. Now, it's not that the Lord doesn't affect our emotions, but it let it be the Lord affecting our emotions and not our emotions affecting the Lord. Because if the soul is ruling, it, the, our emotions will overrule the Lord. Our own mind will overrule the mind of Christ. And our own will will overrule the will of God. But if the Lord is taking that ground and, you know, he's in our spirit, he's joined to our spirit, not to our soul. He lives joined to our spirit and us joined to him. Those who have joined themselves to the Lord are one spirit with him. Corinthians 6, 17. His objective is to take possession of the soul, soul life, which is within that is self life. Satan didn't have a soul. His fall was around self life. He doesn't have a soul. Self was his fall. For us, it's both. So, the Lord taking over, taking possession, breaking the power of our soul, our will, soul will, our soul's mind, our reasoning, and our soul's emotions taking possession of the emotions. Don't we want that? Thank you for your wonderful response. <laughs> How many want the Lord to take possession? I know we do. I'm just I'm messing with us. <laughs> he takes possession of the soul so that when the Lord joined our spirit, comes through us, our soul, and through our body, he's untainted. It's not just, well, the Lord's just coming forth. Not without your soul and flesh. Not through you, he's not. He's going to come through your soul. And come through your body. Hello? Yeah. And so he must reign. Right, Randall? He must reign. He must subjugate the soul, lest he be tainted by our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, our reasoning. Anyway, you guys know this, but I'm trying to be clear. 
as to the battleground. The soul will interpret the darkness. The soul will interpret the confrontation with the dragon. Here's my point. The soul, if it's not, I'm telling you, if it's not conquered by the Lord, the soul is going to interpret its reasoning power, its mind, as well as its will. It's going to interpret that moment of confrontation, moments of confrontation with the dragon as, where is the Lord? What a battle. Where are you, Lord? Where are you, Lord? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Lord within us has not forsaken us. But the Lord is not going to meet us on the ground of the soul either. He's not going to meet us on the ground of self. He will not come onto that ground to meet us. He will deal with us there, but he's not meeting with us on that ground. Oh, be comforted, soul, in that way. No, it's be conquered, soul. You know, I can, I, listen, he can put out the fire out there or he can deal with my soul so that the fire doesn't bother me anymore. The fiery trial, I mean, the test. Say, like, oh, take care of this test. I'd rather take care of you, Terry, because you're the problem. <laughs> well, I don't mean that in a bad way. He's just got to deal with my soul. He loves us. I keep trying to say this to us. He's in love with you. That's why he's doing what he's doing with us. Right? Can we say that? He's making a bride ready. Amen. So the final word after my God, my God, why have you forsaken me becomes into your hands. There's trust again. And there's entrusting. There's trust. So he's entrusting himself to the Father fully. The woman facing the battle she's going to face must come to this right here into your hands. It's already been being a work done, but in that darkness, and it will be, and uh, if we interpret God's silence to be his distance, we are in trouble. If we inter interpret the lack of God speaking as God's absence, we are in trouble. Wouldn't you say, Jacob? We're in bad trouble, aren't we? Because neither of those equations are true. In marriage, you guys who have been married for a while, not you younger married people. <laughs> I'm messing around there. So in marriage, there's unspoken love, right? Hello? Okay, now this is your chance. <laughs> Married men and women, <laughs> you don't have to run your mouth and say, I love you every three seconds to be convinced that your mate loves you. Action should speak louder than words. Longevity should be part of proof. How many believe that? I just want to make sure. Well, Okay, how many don't believe it? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. How many don't believe it? It's the doghouse for you. <laughs> your wife will build it, husbands, or your husbands will build it, wives. Whichever, whichever, wherever the case might be. Longevity. Relational longevity. Am I saying that right? Relational longevity is proof of love. With God, Christ is that he's in you is proof of the love of God. The cross demonstrates, but Christ within is proof of the love of God. He has placed his son as life in you. It don't get any better than that. It only gets better. He's going to increase, increase, increase. With him is all things pertaining to life and godliness, including the love of God. So the proof is that God is in you in his son and by his spirit and God the Father is taking up residence in you as well. The Godhead is in you. You have become a temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives in you. Christ in you is the hope of glory. 
quoting the Gospel of John, my Father and I will come and make our home inside of you. There's the Godhead in view, in the Spirit. God being one Spirit. Three distinct personalities, we would say, but one Spirit. The Godhead's in you. That's the proof of the love of God. He's in you. Not outside you aiding you, He's in you. I can't overemphasize that point. Because if we're looking at circumstances as proof of the love of God, we're going to arrive at day to day a different conclusion. But there's an eternal truth of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is our hope. And it's not a hope so hope, it's a no so hope. He is in me. He has not forsaken me, He is in me. Again, my God, my God, you will not forsake me. Isn't that what He said? It was very, didn't He say that? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Isn't that what he said? Beautiful, huh? What do you think, Serena? Beautiful. He is quite beautiful, isn't he? He was forsaken so that we won't be. Corporately speaking, he was forsaken so that we would not be. You will never be forsaken of him. He will not forsake. We may forsake him, but he will not forsake us. He will not be unfaithful to us. We may be unfaithful. He will not be unfaithful to us. I'm just quoting the scriptures here. Though we are faithless, he remains faithful. There's the scripture. Amen. What time is it? 1292? <laughs> what? What? <third? laughs> You must be on a different time. <laughs> what time is it? Oh, it's uh, 5 till 12. 5 till 12. Can you believe that? What a miracle. There are miracles. I'm almost through. I only have another hour and a half. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm really, we're coming to the end. We're running out of words from the cross. I guess that sort of means we're running out of message. Never meant that before, but we'll go for it. <laughs> So it comes to this, he, the Lord is trusting his Father. Though all the voices around him, you saved others, save yourself. Right? Not a good thing, Teresa, you think? Those voices we could do without, don't you think, Jacob? <laughs> I mean, a southerner on the cross, could you guys shut up? I'm trying to concentrate here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I get Neil started. I've heard about your sense of humor. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> Can y'all be quiet? Can't you see? This is an intense moment. <laughs> Don't work that way, does it? Come on, guys, laugh. Thank y'all for laughing. Somebody laugh. Come on, let's laugh about it. <laughs> I wish we could maintain our sense of humor when it's really intense, Hal. Don't you, brother? I mean, God help us in this. And be able to laugh. Otherwise, we're going to cry all the time. And we've, I'm, I'm gonna, I plan on crying more. I've cried already. Rivers. <laughs> I like to laugh. I like to see the humor in things, even if it doesn't exist. <laughs> Make up my own fantasy about it, <laughs> like I did last night. Brian preaching, and he reaches a high point, if there ever is one. <laughs> That's what we failed to recognize last night, Drew, don't you think, brother? <laughs> that was at his expense. He can pay me back. <laughs> he reaches a high point in his preaching. We pull out our pistols with blanks, because Drew was like, well, shoot the gas line. And so we pull out our pistols. <laughs> Wonderful message. <laughs> what do you think, Scott? That, now, that's funny, isn't it? <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> if we had the money to do a skit, I was talking to Drew, we were talking about it last night. If we had the money to do a skit, we could do some really, big, well, I think the southern word, Bonnie, is doozies. Do they still use that word? Do you still use that word? That's a doozy. What's that even mean? <laughs> Where'd that come from anyway? I said, surely it's not the king's English. Of course, the king's English was never the right English anyway. 
<clears throat> it took, uh, you know, a few more hundreds of years to get to Southern English, and then it was perfected. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the final word then, I won't turn there. You know it's in the Gospel of John. The final word is it is finished. But it's not finished until the test is conquered. The temptation is conquered. The test, its purpose is brought to fullness. It is finished, Jesus says, when we have trusted. And it will be finished for the woman. Readiness will be finished. When this test is passed, can you see then for the woman what that final time period is about? Trust. Have you, have I learned to trust him in the darkness? in direct confrontation with the dragon. In the hour, again, Revelation chapter 3, the hour of testing that I talked about last night comes upon the world. That hour of darkness, we pinpointed it last night. The meaning of the Greek word as pertains to the time will be the hour of darkness. That fourth Hour, let's say it this way, split into four time periods, a 24-hour day split into four specific time frames. In the hour of darkness, have we learned to trust all that he's been doing with us, all that we've been going through, what the Lord is doing, what the Lord is allowing. Satan's doing something too. But he's not doing what the Lord's doing. The Lord's not doing what Satan's doing. Right? Let's don't get that confused. Satan names to steal, kill, and destroy. That's not the purpose of the Lord. The purpose of the Lord is to bring trust. Much more than that, but that's part of it. So in the direct confrontation with Satan, with the dragon, with the devil, in the time of darkness, into your hands, I commit my spirit. It is finished. For the man child, direct confrontation with the beast, I found this to be true. The Lord has no difficulty putting demons in their places, including the dragon. The problem is people. What are you going to do with them? The beast. Terry, are you saying the beast empowered by the dragon? The beast empowered by the dragon, because that's true. The beast draws its power from the dragon. But the dragon has a vessel. In fact, I can say it this way. The dragon has a man vessel, a man of lawlessness. The mystery that's in that vessel, as is said, the mystery of lawlessness. The dragon has a vessel to get at the man-child. Right? There's always going to be Nero's. There's always going to be Diocletian's. There's always going to be a Domitian. Roman emperor's type personages, demonically energized. He can get at God's people. But the woman, the man-child, passes the test of trust in the Lord, in the darkness, in the battle. Into your hands I commit my spirit. That final full length of time will be brought right there. It'll be over and over again repeated, but it'll be brought right there into your hands. I commit my spirit. It is finished, and it will be. The Lord will return. Full, 
full readiness, full preparation lies in that little phrase. And the distinction between my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me to into your hands I commit my spirit. But not just in language and not in doctrine and not in theory and not in the ethereal but in reality in direct confrontation with the dragon. Because I could say now, oh yeah, that's there. Wait to the confrontation with the dragon directly. Wait for the confrontation with the beast directly. And then let's talk. Right? So... Uh, I want you just to, right where you're at, just put your hands on your heart. I hope all of our hearts are in the right place. And I'm thinking of locational, not spiritually. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm thinking of spiritually, not locational. <laughs> I'm going to get Neil started. <laughs> if I look out and I see your hand down around here somewhere, I'm thinking, wow, locationally, you got, you got a problem. <laughs> you need an operation. <laughs> If I have to stand on your shoulder, <laughs> I'm sorry. I know that's silly. <laughs> I'll get a good laugh out of it, and then we'll go on. So, still got your hands on your heart, I say. Good. Now, Lord. I'm just confessing before everyone. There's been many times in the heat of battle when it's been more of, why am I forsaken? Where are you, Lord, kind of language coming out of me? Where are you, Lord? Why? Questioning. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Why is this being allowed? Why? The Lord corrected me, not that it did a lot of good. He corrected me by his voice, but I need him to possess me inwardly before there's any real correction. But he did correct me by his voice. You're asking me the wrong question. You're implicating me, Terry. You're asking me why. That's implicating me. Why don't you instead make it into this question? What are you doing, Lord? That's the right question. I don't want to implicate him, but I have, brother. I, I apologize to the Lord and in front of you guys. I've implicated him with the why question. I repent. I don't want that to be ever coming out of my mouth again. And now of all times, I have to, I want to have a trained ear to hear what the Spirit is saying eyes that see him that are fixed on Jesus. What are you doing, Lord? You're bringing me from why have you forsaken me to in your hands I commit my spirit. Lord, in our hearts right now, I pray for you as the Prince of Peace. And as you finish the work that you have begun, May we see more clearly than ever before a part, a portion of that work. As Lord, I've tempted today to share it. I ask in the name of Jesus, finish the work. Finish the work. I pray. I think the seal of God is the right language right now. Holy Spirit, seal me once again by your increase, Holy Spirit. Seal me once again. Your increase, Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit again. Be filled with the Holy Spirit again. I receive you, Holy Spirit, again. There's a seal upon my heart. 
upon my mind, upon my very being, my whole being, body, soul, and spirit. Be in us. Be in us, Holy Spirit. Be in us, Lord Jesus. Be in us, Father. Be in us. You want us to be the dwelling place of God in the Spirit? We want to be the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Be in us greater. You have not forsaken us. You will not forsake us. Say that again. You have not forsaken me, Lord, and you will not forsaken me forsake me. I am not forsaken. I am not forsaken. I'm not trying to do mind over matter. It's just the reality of it. It's the truth. I should believe it because it's the truth that who, who he is. I don't put my faith in faith. I put my faith in the Lord. In fact, the Lord is my for faith. He is the source. Lord, arise within us. Arise within us as the faith. Arise within us as the trust that we might entrust ourselves fully to you. Into your hands I commit my spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Terry, thank you so much, Terry. That was great. Amen. Well, I just want to say a prayer as we end the conference, uh, just a prayer of gratitude to the Lord. So join me in prayer. Father, we just, Lord, we really are honored and grateful for these three days. Lord, all that you did, I feel like you did so much. There's just a download of information, Lord, and just so much to process. But thank you, Father, for coming to us in the way that you did, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would seal every bit of the work that was accomplished, every bit of the work that was done. Lord, I pray that you would seal it up in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, you would protect everyone as they leave and go. Father, we just want to pray a special protection upon them, Lord, just that you would give your angels charge concerning them, Lord, that the blood of Jesus would cover them. And Lord, you would seal that work, we pray, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I have one announcement. This announcement is for our church only. Um, I, I